Everybody wants financial freedom and they want to travel the world. It's not a goal. That's just a dream. So define financial freedom. For us, it was $800,000 a year in income, $15 million in liquidity. We've checked both of those boxes. Now it's just what happens in our personal life. We keep track. And, and so we meet every Friday for four hours to audit what's happened the previous week. Welcome to the Physicians and Properties Podcast. The show where we teach you how investing in real estate can give you the freedom to practice medicine and live life how you want. Doctor. 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 Now, here's your host, Dr. Alex Schlow. Wow. Guys, this episode was amazing. I had the opportunity to interview someone I admire who I followed for a long time who is a legend in the short-term rental space. Such an incredible podcast, so much valuable insight, both in business, both in life, relationships, incredible podcast. There's something here to be gained for everyone who's listening to this episode. Today, our guest is none other than Bill Faith. If you're in the short-term rental community, you know who Bill is. He's incredible. He's been involved in real estate for over 25 years. He's built numerous multi-million dollar businesses that he's exited. He focused largely in commercial and long-term rentals, but pivoted in 2015 the majority of his portfolio to short-term rentals from long-term after he saw a huge opportunity to increase profit, increase cash flow by 3x, 4x than what he was getting on these long-term rental properties and minimize his risk. He's got a multi-million dollar portfolio of just absolutely incredible short-term rental properties and vacation rental markets focusing on beach properties, lake properties, mountain properties. We talk about his upbringing, how his mom was the catalyst for why he was so successful and she taught him so much growing up as a child about business. We talk about his start and his journey into real estate, his time as a golf pro, his different businesses that he's built. We also hit on tons of tangible things that you can use for your short-term rentals in order to emoji stack, which is a new term that I learned or using chat GPT to help optimize your listing. So much tangible knowledge was shared that's going to help you in investing. But Bill is an open book and opened up on so much valuable insight and wisdom into relationships, into time spent with his wife, into the retirement journey that's coming up in the next few years. Guys, this podcast was incredible. I don't think I'm going to sleep tonight. It's about nine o'clock here and I'm recording this and just so much to think about. So If you gain something from this podcast, please do me a favor, subscribe to the podcast, share this with one or two friends you think would benefit from it. Without any further ado, let's get to today's episode with Bill Faith. Hey, Bill, welcome to the Physicians and Properties podcast. So honored to have you on the show tonight. Thank you for your time. How are things going? They're going great. Thanks for having me, Alex. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here. Absolutely. It's my honor and pleasure to have you on the show. I've been in the Build Short-Term Rental Wealth Facebook group for a long time and been following what you're doing and just super honored to have you on here and excited to pick your brain a little bit and teach others along the way. So thanks again. You're very welcome. I'm ready. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, first, if you don't mind, just kind of telling folks a little bit about yourself and uh, we'll just start there. Okay. Sure. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. I've been a born again redneck for just over 20 (laughs) years by way of Southern California. Grew up in SoCal playing golf and had a full ride to UCLA. Was a third ranked golfer in the world coming out of of high school. Thought I knew everything like most 18, 19 year olds dropped out of school after my first semester actually and gave up my full ride and turned professional. That led to my first real estate investment. Netted about 180 grand in my first year. I didn't think I was going to get started. My whole family was in education. They pretty much disowned me when I dropped <laughs> college. But a, a good friend from Bakersfield, California, and a mentor and a father figure, Buck Owens, who was kind of the godfather of country music, gave me 25 grand to get started, no strings attached. Ironically, I made a pretty decent living the first year, made about 180K net. And my CPA, Jeff Stewart, you know, who ended up being my best man at my wedding, said, dude, wow. take that to Vegas. Let's do something and with it. And so I bought a duplex with the cash and I actually held it for over 20 years, 22 years, actually. And I got some pretty nice appreciation over those years, but I was in long-term, you know, investments. I've done commercial. I built a 55,000 square foot warehouse and office building that was uh, gold lead certified. 
in Nashville, I started investing into long-term rentals, condos and stuff downtown. I've been in industrial space and I had a ground transportation company. I don't know if you know, but I've done 29 startups, bootstrapped all of them, had 19 successful exits, built a couple of businesses over 30 mil and did one over 50 million. And I don't really like big businesses. So I kind of re-architected my life and I'd exited out of a ground transportation company, like a large corporate limousine company. I built the fastest growing company in the limousine industry in about four and a half years. And I was battling Uber in 2000, or late 11, 2012, 13. I helped write the legislation here in Nashville, Tennessee to regulate the ground transportation industry. Then Uber comes in and there was this friction. You know, there's a lot of similarities in our industry, like between the old school staunch property managers the owners, the new wave of owners like us and the co-hosts, there's a lot of butting of heads. And it was the same thing between the ground transportation industry, the taxi industry and Uber as they started to disrupt. So I was lobbying. Long story short, I mean, for the better part of 16, 18 months, every Tuesday night, I was at a city council meeting, lobbying with them. And I just kept seeing these bills coming. There were more bills coming across with Airbnb. Nashville is a, a very liberal city in the heart, the, you know, the heart of the, the buckle of the Bible belt, essentially in a very red state. So there's this political dynamic here that has some unrest and these bills were coming across and they were fighting about them. There was hotel lobbyists. And that's when I really just, I got turned on to short-term rentals. And I had a client in the limo space that was in the short-term rentals, answered a few questions and decided to try test out the short-term rentals. And my business partner, my glow golf business bought our first property in Estes Park, Colorado. Then we jointly got a condo in Destin. And then my wife and I bought our first property together in 2015, which was a single family home in Gulf Shores, Alabama. That's kind of how I got started. That's awesome. Wow. A lot to unpack there. Speaking of Estes, we're actually heading up to Rocky Mountain National Park tomorrow. I spent some nice. time camping up in the spot. mountains. Oh, it's the best. Yeah. We love getting up there. My two and a half year old son, his favorite animal is an elk, which is really interesting because I feel like typically, you know, it's the lion or, or a bear or something else, but he loves elk. So he's all excited. He's got his little binoculars packed to go up to Estes and look at the elk. That's so awesome. looking well, forward to that. You a place called the Elk Lodge, ironically, in a place oh. called Banner Elk that has oh. zero elk. And there's no <laughs> elk there. Sounds good. Well, he'll probably still want to stay there. So we'll have to hit you up for that sometime. But that's awesome. Well, yeah, lots of successes in a really broad space. I mean, business, long-term rentals, short-term rentals, commercial properties. I mean, you name it, we could take this all kinds of different directions. I think one just kind of overarching thing I've noticed is one, incredibly successful what was the key you feel like to all your success initially getting started? Was there like a, a mindset shift that you had or something where you're, that just really kind of motivated you and really helped have all this success going forward? I think it was being raised by being an only child raised by a, a single mother that was a teacher in the 70s and the 80s that probably never made more than 30 grand a year that gave me every single opportunity to become successful. You know, my parents and my grandparents were in education. She pushed me to be a great student, but I was on my own. She worked too, like I, I, there were stores called like Mervyn's and stuff like that back in California. She was a teacher that was working nights at Mervyn's and, you know, worked through the holidays, two additional jobs and double shift on the weekends, just to where she could pay for me to have the newest Jordans when I was playing basketball. And when I started getting really good at golf, started excelling, I mean, it was a lot of money for us to spend a thousand bucks for two airline tickets and to go to Kentucky to fly across the country to, to play in a golf tournament. And she didn't have that, the fun. So she invested everything into me. And when I was about a, probably a freshman in high school, maybe eighth grade, I got started in golf in the big brother program. So very loyal to the big brother program, but she also bought a preschool. So she had saved all of her money. She got divorced when I was five. So whatever that was, 1978. And it was probably about 85, 86. She had saved as much money as she could. And she was able to, she started the entrepreneurial journey. And you hear Taylor Swift sing songs about her growing up on a farm and her parent that, you know, the breakfast table was the bill table, paying bills in the morning. And ours is the same way here at our house. And it was the same with my mom. And I remember sitting there, I would sort receipts for, her. and that was kind of my first foray into, into really understanding like a PL, to be honest with you, when I was in high school. Cause they don't teach you that stuff in high school. Right. So one of the things that I think one being independent, I was a latchkey kid. That's an old school term where, you know, mom's working and I'm 
on, I'm, I'm coming home from the bus and I'm taking care. I'm making my own snacks, make, having to do my own homework, practicing basketball, soccer on my own. So I think that independence by circumstance, along with a mother that taught me the most important thing that I think, honestly, I know that you're a doctor and so don't take this personally, but a lot of doctors are not financially literate. I spoke to three of them today. So understanding that literacy as I went into my older adolescence and to adult, adulthood really helped me, especially she walked me through my first business. So I met a guy named Jay Jacoby who owned American Pacific t-shirts in LA playing in a golf tournament down there, what's called a junior am. And he gave me some t-shirts and I've told this story many times and I took them back and they were cool, but I was a Lakers fan. He gave me like Jordan, Barkley, Malone, all these guys, it, those <laughs> shirts were awesome, but I didn't really care about them. I wanted magic. I wanted worthy. I wanted Kareem. I wanted all the Lakers. So I sold them. And I saw him a few months later at another tournament. He's like, Hey, how are the shirts? And my mom kind of gives me one of those looks and she's all, you got to tell him. And I said, look, I'm a Laker fan. I really appreciate it, Jay, but I sold them so I could buy some range balls and practice. And so long story short, he asked my mom if, if we could drive to his house after we got done and said, sure. So him and his wife made us dinner and he took me out to his garage when we got done with my mom. He said, here's a hundred t-shirts. I'm going to charge you $5, but you don't have to pay me per shirt until you get, you come back and you can go and sell these. And he's all, I would suggest you sell them at 15 to 20 bucks. I sold them for $25, got three friends. We sold a hundred t-shirts within two weeks. We went back down and got more. That was my first business. My mom made me sit at that same table where she would pay her bills, probably in our $75,000 house. And she would make, teach me how to keep track of what my profit is. And hey, you sold 32 shirts at the, the football games this weekend, you know, times five. This is what you owe Mr. Jacoby. If you want to make more money, and this is the first time that I ever heard like raising ADR, like doing an upsell in any type of business. And I was charging 15 bucks. She's all, you're going to have to pay me for gas. And it costs us like $70 to get to LA and back or whatever it was. I can't remember. Yeah. So she's, I would suggest you probably raise your price to $20. Then like the next time we'd sell out, you might want to raise your price to 25. And that was really the first business experience that I ever had. And it was with my mom, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, your mom really set the example. It sounds like that completely transformed your life. And I 100% agree with you. Doctors get all this education in the medical space and we're in school for so long and we're learning so much medicine and we get zero financial education. Uh, of course, Jim Dolly and the White Coat Investor was kind of the first start to change that and provide some financial literacy to physicians, but there's still such a huge lack. And I think especially more so in the real estate space, which is kind of the reason why I started Physicians and Properties was to see how you could invest in real estate and that can give you the freedom to practice medicine and live life how you want to. And so that was really the drive behind that. I couldn't agree more. Is the faith household the same? Are you guys uh, still doing profit and loss statements at the table and teaching the family or what's that look like for you? Yeah. I mean, one of my big initiatives was to teach my two girls. I have a freshman and a senior in high school, 14 and 17, about financial literacy. Dave Ramsey just happens to live like right there. So, I mean, and I know <laughs> Dave and he's helped me with that. So they've been on commission since they were probably in second or third grade. They understand the value of a dollar. They know everything. I mean, I'm an open book. They know they've been to all of mom and dad, mommy and daddy's properties. They know what they cost. They know how many millions of dollars that we've invested. They know how much money we make. They're very aware because I don't want them to be afraid to talk about these things. Too many people are, I mean, literally for the first time I've made my, like, as we're recording this, I've made access to my mastermind public. So I'm having oh, cool. these discussions like four doctors today. And some are like, hey, how much are you earning? And well, I'm like, dude, if you want me to help you, this is like knowing and being known. Big difference if you're in residency making 57 or you're right. like your first or second year out making 300 versus you're making yeah. three quarters of a million, right? right. We got to talk tax strategies, cost segregations. We got to talk land values, all these things. If I'm really going to be able to help you, if you want to dive in and it's just uncomfortable for so many people because you're not. You don't grow up in that environment, right? So I think that's a distinct advantage that my mother gave to me. Yeah, I've had, my kids have had uh, green light debit cards since they were 13. They have no social media. They've never had caffeine. They've never had uh, fast food outside of Chick-fil-A, but yet they've had a, a credit and they have an Amex platinum card. So that way I yeah. can tee them up to where they have a perfect 50 score. So my oldest daughter will turn 21 or 18 on the 21st of November. 
She's going to have a perfect 850 credit score. I wish I would have had that when I turned 18. My borrowing power would have skyrocketed back then. Oh, absolutely. Well, plus the platinum card gets you free access to the airport lounges too, which is nice. I got a platinum card as well. And uh, it's good stuff. But of course, the credit's way more important than that. And just the the skills that you've imparted in them is going to just completely change the direction of their life. If yours was different, if you didn't have that example from your mother. So that's really cool to share that. I, yeah, I've I come been trying from, to talk my oldest daughter out of going becoming a doctor, actually. <laughs> oh, really? She, well, hey. She's a senior, and she's, she's a, going to Belmont University next year. They have yeah. a new pre-med program, about a $2 billion, you know, new buildings and all yeah. that, or billion dollars worth of investment into their program. Yeah. She's really excited. But it, it's funny because, I don't know about you, Alex, a lot of people that I know in this industry that are physicians, anesthesiologists, they want to get out because the burnout is so high for you guys. Right. And I think that really impacts their investing strategy in one particular instance in a negative fashion. I see a lot of doctors that are making decisions just based on the tax benefits, like a cost segregation study, as opposed to making sure that they're making wise and sound investments that are going to cash flow and appreciate. Um, And that's just one thing. As I think about it, I want to make sure that I make abundantly clear that I would never advise Ryan Bakey on my super team would never advise as probably one of the foremost CPAs to purchase a property just based on a cost seg benefit, because then you get a one year accelerated depreciation and sure a little bit of that amortizes over three, four, five years. But then if you have something that's losing 10 grand, 20 grand a year, it's going to drag down your portfolio and then you're going to want to sell. And then that cost seg is going to be recaptured. So make sure that you are underwriting your properties accurately to where they are generating cash flow positive and not just taking advantage of a cost segregation. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. All about cash flow here for, for many different reasons. I can can relate to the burnout. I, I personally am very worried about where medicine is heading in America. And you know, the pandemic really kind of expedited the mass exodus from medicine for physicians and for nurses and so forth. And we're seeing, you know, tons of burnt out providers that are leaving medicine. And these are really good doctors. It's really frustrating to see because a lot of times it's because big medicine is pushing more and more uh, appointments and more and more patient encounters and more and more administrative things onto these physicians, including myself, that there's only so much time in the day. There was a study that was done recently that was looking at family medicine. It was looking at if you were to follow the guidelines that are put out for a normal clinic day, it would take 23 hours to finish that day. And it, we don't have 23 hours, obviously. It's, frankly, it's kind of terrifying about what the future of medicine is going to look like. And I think that's a perfect pivot point for for real estate and cash flow to talk about how that can give you freedom uh, to practice medicine, live life how you want, spend more time with your family, travel more because you have that cushion, you have that protection from cash flow coming in that allows you to do that, allows you to work part time if you want to, or start a new clinic if you want to. I mean, just that opens up the doors for a lot of more opportunity going forward. So we can kind of pivot the conversation if you like more towards real estate and you know specifically short-term rentals and the benefit that you've seen with that. And I'd also love to hear, if you don't mind, Bill, just kind of your transition into short-term rentals and kind of what the mindset was behind that, because you've had a lot of experience all across the board in terms of real estate investing. Yeah. I mean, short-term rentals is not my only business venture at this point. I've got uh, five other businesses, so I typically have three or four going. I've got six currently all together right now. But the reason that I got into short-term rentals is like many other people, I started in long-term. And when I started doing research and I saw in 15 that I could get roughly about four to five X, I thought, and that's about what happened. It was three and a half to five X LTR when I first got into the short-term rental space. But then relatively quickly, like about four to six months in, I started learning about what I now call how to build a super property. And, you know, I, I went into a tertiary market, really a sec, really a tertiary market. So I was sitting in 30A in actually Seaside at the pizza place that's still there with a gentleman that I was a groomsman in my wedding that owned over 300 properties in Destin. He owned a resort. He tore it down after after 2000, built a bunch of, of house, single family homes, townhomes. It used to be the Frangista Beach Inn down there. Some people will be aware of that. Now he owns Frangista uh, Beach Property Management and owns his own portfolio. And it's massive. 
So we're sitting down there at, on fall break, and his name's William Wilson, and I said, Wee Wee. I called him Wee Wee. He called me Six Pack, not <laughs> because I had abs back in the day, believe me. And <laughs> I said, Bria want, Bria's my wife's name. She wants, a, she wants to buy a beach house. She wants to hear the, the waves crash. She wants to see the water. She wants to smell the salt. He's all, how much cash do you want to invest? I said, $127,000. He's all, and this is eight, nine years ago. We're talking 2015. He's all, you can't afford here. He's all, you'll be four or five blocks for a $600,000 property off the beach. If that's what she wants, Yeah. you need to go to the Redneck Riviera, go check out Gulf Shores. So we flew home after we got done. I immediately looked on Zillow, Realtor.com, whatever it was back then. And, and I started looking at properties and we couldn't really afford in Gulf Shores either. So we went out to Fort Morgan, Alabama. I contacted a realtor, found a couple of places that I wanted to look at, knew nothing about underwriting properties, didn't know about or if even Air, AirDNA existed back then. There just was nothing except for to go off what the, the real estate agent would tell you off the, and then they're, they're t sharing you their property management numbers because those are always combined back then, right? So we saw 10 houses in one day. The first house was the first one that I identified. We ended up buying it and have the property management company associated with the broker property manage it and literally within weeks i'm asking questions how do you determine pricing how come i can't see anything why isn't this transparent why do i not own my airbnb and verbo listings you know what's the marketing budget are you running facebook ads what are you doing for seo because i i'd had an 11 million dollar marketing agency at the time and they weren't doing anything oh, so no. basically i i went in and they're just not being transparent. And after asking them all these questions, I just said, fuck it. I'm going, I'm taking over. And I just cut yeah. cold turkey immediately. Like cancel reservations, showed up down there with a new handyman, changed the locks because they were just evading everything that I was doing. And I went in and I took over and I created an Airbnb listing. I wasn't even on Verbo, no direct bookings, any of that type of stuff, no PMS. And I just started marketing my property. And I found out that I could make another two, three thousand dollars a week. It was it was summertime. They were charging twenty five hundred dollars a week. I'm like, well, shit, I can get five grand a week. Yeah. And you know, I just started putting it on my own social media here in Nashville, my own accounts. And it just started booking and booking. And then I just started researching and reading and researching and reading. There were no influencers back then, right? There was no clubhouse. There was no Facebook groups at that time. And so I did what I do best. I know how to build and scale businesses. I know how to do digital marketing very well. And that's what I used. And I built a case study off of it that I used when I launched this business on. They did 44 grand in rental income the year before I bought. I ended up doing 98 in year number one, 112 in year number two. But it's because of the value stacking, right? So a lot of people say, Bill, well, what is a super property? You're building these super properties. Do you have to spend millions of dollars? No. I mean, this was a $629 house, but it had tier one views. It was in a community called Morgantown that had two community pools. It had tennis courts. I could walk to the beach in less than a hundred steps. So instead of in my listing and in my marketing, telling people that I, you can walk to the beach, I'm telling them it's like 87 steps to the beach. You can hear the waves crashing when you're relaxing on the back deck. I'm writing experiential copy, right? So all those things as a marketer and, and a successful business owner, I just applied to short-term rentals and it was actually pretty easy. It's honestly still easy, uh, even though it's hard now for most, right? So most people that got in 2020, 2021, 2022, they don't understand how hard we had to work you know, to hit 60, 65% occupancy, occupancy in these vacation rental markets yeah. in 16, 17, 18, and 19. Everything right. changed with COVID. We all know that, but now there's no Airbnb bust. That's a BS hashtag, in my opinion, unless you bought the wrong property and you overpaid during the pandemic and you really didn't educate yourself and do the research, which is probably about 80% of the investors that got in and were buying properties sight unseen. If you do the right things, like my mastermind members call it the mastermind markup, they're outperforming the 90th percentile of uh, air DNA by 30%. And that's on the trailing 12, right? So that's last summer's numbers as of right now, which most people are down 15 to 20%. Ours are up like 16, 17%.
they're doing the right things. You just got to learn how to market, how to do your listing optimization, you know, how to stack value. A lot of people think, Alex, that you got to spend $2 million to have a super property. You don't. My sweet spot has been 650000 to 900000 putting roughly $100,000 to $125,000 into the property post-close and value stacking amenities. That's why I, I provide tampons and you know extra toothbrushes and toothpaste and uh, these little amenity kits that other people don't provide. I've got USB chargers at every single nightstand. I do my di- the Fiji water uh, you know, in every single refrigerator and then put bottles of either Aquafina or Dasani on the nightstands. Coffee bars, waffle bars, now milkshake bars at my property in Montana. My property in Montana is a prime example It needed almost nothing because of the river and the views that I had in the location. I just literally yesterday got my barrel sauna installed so I could sit on the deck and literally through, I got extra for the glass door and take photos of down the river into the lake with, you know, the trees and seeing the Canadian Rockies. So I can market that from the hot tub that's right next door to the barrel sauna. Why would I spend an extra 30K for those three things. Add on a deck, reinforce the deck, add a hot tub and a barrel sauna so nobody can fucking compete with me. Nobody in that market at any property. And they're going to have to spend some significant money to be able to catch up, right? So that's kind of what goes into building these super properties that well outperform the numbers on AirDNA. Your Montana property is just breathtaking. I mean, the, the views are incredible. The location, the home, I mean, everything you said, it's just incredible. As soon as I saw you post about that house, I was like, oh my goodness, that's the dream. I think I even commented on it. Like that's my dream house right there. Cause I love the mountains so much and the river just incredible. And I think it's so important what you've said here. And I really hope people are paying attention to it. Everyone thought they could just take a cell phone picture of their house and put it on Airbnb and they were going to make all this money. The time for that is over. And you really need to have that really Instagrammable property with all the amenities and a great location with a great view. That's what's going to be successful. And we've learned that too. We have a geodesic dome house that's a stick build, but two bedroom, one in like a quarter bath house up in the mountains in Colorado. Beautiful mountain view. There's moose walking by all the time you know, hot tub, all the works and it stayed so well. It looks like an Instagram property. And yeah, we're up. Our average daily rate is up and uh, everyone's saying Airbnb bust. And we're like, this isn't happening for us. And the reason is exactly what you're saying, turning it into a super property, maximizing amenities, maximizing location. Bill, I'm fired up. This is awesome. Yeah, the, the, here's the issue, right? So I don't know if anybody, I've got a couple of podcasts myself and like I do STRnomics with Kenny Bedwell, the founder of STR Insights. And Kenny's a former like, top two data analyst at Citibank. And he brings that experience into our industry. And the data that I get access to and that we share on STRnomics is not available to the public. What we are seeing is him and I are looking for properties every day for our, my own portfolios. I'm always a buyer, but also for clients that we service. The separation of church and state, the separation of the lower class and the super class in short-term rentals, the gap is widening and it's widening very, very fast. And what I mean by that is, is you either need to be in the one or two bedroom range and you can still turn those into two, into super properties, but it's the lower price point volume play, higher occupancy, kind of what I call the Gatlinburg mentality, or you're going to the top and you're yeah. going to have a four bedroom and you're getting top three, top five competitors in the five and the six bedroom DR because of what you've done to the property. And there's one thing that's not talked a whole lot about Alex. It's, and it's a word people focus on location and views. And I want to add something in there that I think is even more important or just as important. And it's proximity. And people think when I use the word proximity, that's the same thing as location. It's not. And I'm going to use my Montana house as an example. My father-in-law and I, I mean, I was on the deck. He's sitting the outdoor dining table. I've got the Traeger turned on. I threw a tri-tip on the Traeger. And the tri-tip, if anybody is from California, knows what tri-tip is. That takes a good hour, you know, maybe an hour and 15 minutes to cook if you're cooking it low and slow on smoker, right? We're sitting there having a glass of wine. I said, hold on. I walk back inside. I go to my storage. I grab out one of my fly rods. He's all, what are you doing? He's all, don't you need to keep an eye on that steak? I said, man, I can fish right here from my deck. So I'm literally on the deck 
throwing the fly. There's no way I was going to catch a fish, but it was kind of fun to sit there. It's like 20 feet away, 25 feet away to the water. The reason I bring this up, not to brag or anything, that's proximity that I can literally be on my deck fly fishing, throwing a fly. So the point is, is it's like 16 steps to get to the edge of the water from my deck. That's proximity. A mastermind member has a, a house on a river about 30 minutes from me. And he crushes it. Three bedroom, three bath, doing like 1800 a night, you know, during the summer, doing $180,000 a year in revenue. But he doesn't have, and he's on a river. He's on the Hungry Horse or on the Flathead River. He does not have proximity. It's like elevated 20 feet. He has no access to the water. So that's being riverfront. That's got views. That's got gr even a great location. But there's no proximity because the water is not accessible. It's like when you have, a, you can see the ocean and you're tier three, but you have this condo building in front of you. So your guests have to walk a block down, then come over and then go to the beach access. And it takes them like five minutes to walk there. Although it looks when you do the overhead shot, like you can walk straight ahead. That creates bad reviews and guest angst, unless you are very clear to let them know that you're really not that close. That proximity is just as important as location and views. And I think most people, when they're evaluating properties and looking for their canvas to paint, they don't take that into consideration or don't understand the difference. Yeah, that's huge. I, I haven't really thought about it in that way either. So thanks for conceptualizing that. I think that's really important. You brought up a good point too, guest expectations and really meeting people's expectations or giving them a fair warning of like, hey, it is a longer walk to the beach or you have to walk around this helps keep those five-star reviews coming in and helps keep, the, keep people from getting disappointed, which of course we're trying to give them the best experience possible in these, in these homes. So what would you say, Bill, are like the top three value add amenities that you would put in your short-term rental? What have you found has generated the most increase in your average daily rate? Probably a house that I no longer have. It was my first lake property on Smith Lake, just north of Birmingham and south of it, of Nashville. And so I did Avery Carl's enemy method. I, I manually researched every single property on the lake. I was a four bedroom, three bath. So I was looking at four bedrooms, five bedrooms, and six bedrooms, all the ADRs. And nobody had an outdoor fireplace that was not like on their deck attached to the house that was set back from the water or super high. So my wife and I built an outdoor fireplace, you know, with basically telephone poles, which is what the person that built are, instead of using like six by sixes or eight by eights or 10 by 10 posts, they use telephone poles. And we put string lights and poured a pad, made it super nice, right? We're talking 10 foot tall, but we did it right. We did it inside the floodplain, right on the edge of the water. So that way you could have a fire. You can be right at the edge of the water. You weren't you know, 50 yards off, a hundred yards off back up by the house. Nobody had that. So that was a competitive amenity that we were able to add. It cost us about 18 grand to build it. You know, I own that house for about a year and a half. There's no question I got a return on investment, but it's impossible for me to, add. so I'm not going to say there's one amenity or even two or three. It's about, it's what I call emoji stacking. So when you do a social media post and you have a yeah. fire pit, you should have the fire emoji. When you have a pool, you should have the pool emoji. Beach, you know, you show the umbrella on the beach. When you're doing a hot tub, use a fire emoji in like a pool or something like that. So that's one of the reasons when you look at my properties, I value stack. Yes, I have a, a, a barrel sauna and a hot tub in Montana. Yes, I have a pool at my number one producing property that does over $300,000 a year in Gulf Shores. Yes, I have bikes. Yes, I have a solo stove so I can check the box for a fire pit. I have everything. I got a video game inside of it. I've got a waffle. I have waffle bars. I have milkshake bars. I have breakfast bars. Literally like the breakfast bar is so simple and it takes care of mom. I do not advertise these. That's like a plus one. You go to Amazon, you pay like 20 bucks, 25 bucks. You get a box of 50, like those circular plastic containers of Cheerios and whatever is the raisin bran and all that type of stuff. Just stack seven of them in a pyramid. And so that way when mom and the kids walk in, they just rip one of those open because she forgot to get, didn't have time to get groceries and the kids are hangry when they're, they're cranky and they need something to eat. Those are the small things that most hosts don't pay attention to, right? And then here's the big thing. If you're going to add all of this shit, you got to market it. 
So that's why I don't want to take credit for creating the coffee bar, but I'm the first one to publicly not only create, and I don't drink coffee, to do the froth or do everything that goes in. Yeah. Beans, grinders, like 18 different types. We had like six different types of ground, six different types of beans, six different types of K-cups, all that different type of stuff. But my wife branded it. She put signs up. We made it look flashy. We made it look nice and it's inexpensive. We did the same thing. Then the next one that we did was our waffle bar. We tested that at our lake house. You know, now at Montana, my next door neighbor refurbishes Hamilton Beach milkshake machines. That's why I did it because he made me this kick-ass milkshake machine. We've had a handful of guests there so far and every single guest, that's the number one thing that they think about. So if you don't know what you need to add, just go to your competitors, your top, go to Airdy and get your top eight. Look at your price labs market report. Look at the top five or what you're tracking in rank breeze and literally go to their reviews, copy, paste their reviews or have your VA do it, put it in a Google doc and then upload it to chat GPT. And the prompt is chat GPT. Give me the top three most positive sentiments in these Airbnb reviews. And they will pull out the three averages of the most positive components of your reviews. Then do the same thing for the negative. And that's how you do some real, really stout market research. Do it for your top five competitors and do it for yourself. This is a masterclass, Bill. Thanks for sharing that. That's uh, such great information. I was salivating a little bit thinking about the coffee bar and then you hit it with the milkshakes. And those are two of my favorites. And certainly I've stayed at a lot of Airbnbs myself. And you always remember those little details. You always remember the host that goes above and beyond. And it's worth paying the extra money to have those amenities, to have those experiences, to have those moments. Because let's be honest, a lot of America, they get, what, two weeks out of the year in vacation. And so they're saving up all their money and they've chose to stay with you at your property. You want to give them the best experience that you can. And I think going the extra mile, not only is it great for the guest experience, but it just greatly increases your revenue. And you're clearly evident of that and how much of a difference some of these changes can make. If you had to pick a favorite property right now, which one would it be? Out of my portfolio? Yeah, out of your portfolio. I mean, it's my Montana property. Yeah. There's no question. I mean, it took me two and a half years to find that thing. I took my family to Yellowstone in the third week of June and COVID in 2020 when everything was still, most of the country was still shut down, I guess. We just fell in love. And, and it's interesting because... Have you ever been to Yellowstone before? Oh, yeah. yeah. So we it. stayed in West Yellowstone. I mean, we did the Tetons and everything else, which are yeah. amazing. But it was once you get about two miles in that West entrance and the Madison River opens up and there was literally we were getting in super early to go look at wildlife in Hayden Valley. It was probably like six o'clock in the morning. Sun had just risen just a little bit of fog or, you know, whatever it was. And there was a guy down there fly fishing and I'm driving and I pulled over. And I'd never fly fish before. And I got out of the car and I told my wife, I said, this is the most beautiful fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. And that's when I knew I wanted to become a fly fisherman. And I said, we need to get a place. We'd, we'd only been in the park for 20 minutes. And <laughs> it was the park. We hadn't seen anything else in Montana. I mean, we flew into Salt Lake City and, and drove to Wyoming and went to Jackson and the Tetons and that type of stuff. But it was our first trip out there. And I looked every, I, I'm sure I missed one day, but figuratively every single day. And it took me two and a half years to find the place. And I, I found quite a few, but they didn't have that perfect proximity and I found it. And so that's our favorite spot. I mean, we thought we were beach people when we first started doing this. Then when we bought the, the lake house, it was all about the lake. Then we bought this massive place in Banner Elk, North Carolina. And we let, then we'd never been really been mountain people. And then we learned how to ski there. And then once we learned how to ski, it was literally right around that time is when I found the place in Montana. So it's been a perfect kind of a, a perfect storm for us. And kind of as I kind of run through those properties, those are all our favorites when we retire part of the year. So those are all lifestyle asset purchases. But much like I said earlier about the cost seg, and I see a lot of professionals coming in and, and buying just for the cost seg. Even though we're building out our assets, we have two beach houses, right? We have a beachfront 3-2 in Fort Morgan, and then we have our massive 6-4 that does $350,000 a year in revenue in, down in West Beach of Gulf Shores. So we typically buy in clusters and we'll buy something, we'll buy or build something big, and then we'll do something small. And the small one will be our retirement home because our retirement plan is to travel around 
these different markets. We love Estes Park. We love Scottsdale. We love Montana. We love the beach. We love Banner Elk. We love the lake. That's why we own ho- why we own homes there. And then also that kind of li- diversification is we can be in one and the big one will pay for both, right? But also by the time we retire in four and a half years, uh, which will be about six and a half years early from the original plan, we should be, if not 100% or very, very close to being debt-free. That's amazing, Bill. Congratulations. That's going to be incredible. And, and what a cool experience to have with your family too, building these businesses and, and get to figure out these places that you love and you get to retire to. Yeah, really excited for you. And I think that folks can really gain a lot from that. I, you know, a lot of times I feel like real estate investors are stuck in, I either need to make as much profit as possible from this investment. And, and they kind of forget the fact that short-term rentals are fun. It's fun to have a property that you're really proud of and you want to go visit. And it's okay to take some time out of the year to go visit these properties and enjoy them because you worked hard for them. And I think sometimes folks have a hard time with that shift of like, oh, well, if I go for one weekend to my property up in the mountains, then I'm losing out on X number of dollars. And personally, I know every time we've gone up to our short-term rentals, the experience we've had has been worth way more than the money that we would have made for that weekend or those few days that we were up there. I agree with you 100%. We typically vacation the entire summer when our kids are out of school and the last two years specifically, roughly eight weeks. Last year, we took them to Disney. The other seven weeks, we're going between all of our properties. This year, we did the Bahamas. The other seven weeks, you know, we're at all of our other properties. I can't think of a better way, you know, to spend a summer, you know, as opposed to just hanging out at home, really doing nothing. But the thing you, you said a few minutes ago, and that's one thing that I think becomes really important. I think a lot of us get lost because we haven't built out this life plan right? So we're investing to invest, we're investing to make money, but there's some really key factors that you need to think about. And it's what's your desired outcome, right? I talk about where we all have the ability to architect our outcome, especially if you're a doctor that's out of residency, that's actually making 300, 500, 750 grand, whatever. Once you have that that access to cash, now I get most of you and you look pretty young, you probably still have a shit ton of, of loans and debt that you have to pay off. Hopefully Actually, Uncle Sam paid for all those for me. I'm I'm active duty Air Force, so they paid for all that. So I'm debt free. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I also don't make uh, anywhere near any of those numbers that you described because Uncle Sam doesn't pay very well. Right. So uh, I mean, it's more than the money, money, right? So you have that desired outcome. You can architect what you want. Then it helps you when you really have clarity on that outcome. You can distill that down to daily decisions. When you distill that down to daily decisions, the only thing that I hear people talking about really is cash on cash return, cash flow, and cost egg studies. Nobody's talking about appreciation and weighing what happens if I can get a 30% cost egg benefit and I buy a property that has very low land value. So people really aren't taking into account investing into the mountains or middle America or rural areas versus being on the beach. There could be a 20, 30% delta between sand and dirt, you know, in the North Carolina mountains. And then you look at appreciation, investing into a property or a market that will have consistent five to 7% appreciation. And I'm kind of getting to to something here, Alex, because I'm under contract getting ready to close on my first condo ever. That's at the entrance almost. It's in Corum, Montana, right four miles from the entrance to Glacier National Park. Well, there it's 950 grand for this two bedroom condo but it's creating a new market. It's a luxury that does not exist in that market. The other thing is the land value is 3%, right? So when you look at 3% land value, 97% dwelling value on 950 Gs, I'm going to get a hefty dollar amount on a cost seg and I fall into that the highest tax bracket, pushing 50%. Uh, that's extremely beneficial. And if you amortize that over five years and then that market, I've done the research on that market even pre-COVID, it's averaging about five to 7% appreciation. So if I just appreciate it 5%, forget about COVID numbers of 20, 20, 30, 40, 50% annually, 5%, you know, 5% on 950 grams, like 45 K. So if I get a $300,000 tax benefit, let's just say even 250, it's going to be more than that. But at 250, you amortize that over four years, 
75K. Then I look at the appreciation, 45K, without turning a dollar. The reality is I've got over $100,000 in tax benefits that I'm going to be able to leverage on an annualized basis amortized over four years. Now, if I can just do 150K and net 45%, which is my typical MO in my portfolio, there's another 70,000 bucks, you know, in cash. You take a property that says it's going to do 84,000 in air DNA and turn it into a $200,000 a year property. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Th there's so many different ways to make money in real estate, to benefit in real estate. And you're right. Sometimes we do get fixated on the one thing, the, the cash flow, the cash on cash return. You're exactly right. I'm uh, looking at the whole picture and your vision and, and your vivid vision for the future and what you want your life to look like is going to be the game changer that's going to set you apart. I have no doubt in my mind that you, Bill, have a very specific vision for what the future looks like for you for the upcoming retirement, and you have it all figured out. It's and, on paper. Uh, it's important. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's, awesome. it's like literally there was a guy named John Bairden that taught me how yeah. to do that in 2015 and 16. And my wife and I are fully aligned. We weren't previously. We know exactly what date we're going to retire. We know how much income we need to have. We know what our debt ratio can be. We know what we're going to do so we can really forecast what it's going to cost. We've forecasted for life events for my two daughters. What happens if they go to Belmont versus going to UT? That's about a $30,000 delta annually. What happens if they need to move home when they're out of college? All these things we've really planned and, and factored in. And there, there'll be bumps in the road. There's no question. And you pivot and you keep moving forward. But if you don't plan and you can't keep score, I look at Tom Brady probably, and I'm not a Brady fan, but the greatest quarterback of all time, right? What did he wear on his wrist? He wore the freaking game plan on his wrist. He's calling plays off of his wrist, right? Why don't we have a wrist guard with our playbook on what our outcome is going to be? The second part is, is if John Baird and Tom, if you can't keep score, imagine Peyton Manning, Peyton Manning and Tom Brady going back and forth for four quarters of a football game getting it into that painted thing on each end of the field, they call an end zone and nobody keeping score. Nobody would watch, right? So if you want to watch, if you want to pay attention to your own score or your own outcome, you have to be able to keep score. That's really cool. Yeah. One of my buddies, actually one of my partners here, we're, we're buying assisted living homes together um, and have a couple of short-term rentals together. He started, he just made his, his goal is ultimately have $30,000 worth of Semi-passive cash flow. Again, we all know there's nothing passive about investing in real estate. It's all just degrees of passivity. But his goal is to have that thirty thousand. So he drew thirty boxes on a big sheet of paper, and every time he crosses out one of those boxes, you know, say hey, that's another thousand dollars a month that's coming in from cash flow, and that's just another way that he's able to keep score. It's a really simple thing to do, but it's just something that keeps him focused and keeps him on task. Other things that are helpful, you know, like the Vivid Vision book by Cameron Harold, the One Thing by Gary Keller. There's a lot of books out there that help kind of focus on the one thing that's going to get you to that next step in life. And your examples and your feedback were excellent as well. I think really important, definitely something that I've been inspired to think a lot more about and really need to sit down with my wife too and really plan out to the detail what our vivid vision looks like for the future. Because we have broad strokes of what we're looking at and what we're looking for, but we're not really grading ourselves. Everybody wants financial freedom and they want to travel the world. It's not a goal. That's just a dream, right? Yeah. So define financial freedom. For us, it was yeah. $800,000 a year in income, $15 million yeah. in liquidity. We've checked both of those boxes. Now it's just what happens in our personal life. We keep track. And, and so we meet every Friday for four hours to audit what's happened the previous week over lunch, ballroom, dancing, whatever. My wife gets to determine what the activity is or what we're doing. So it usually involves wine and Italian food, which I'm 100% <laughs> cool with. It sounds great. <laughs> but we're auditing, you know, did we spend the quality time? Were we present with our kids? Did we have sex at least three times in the last week? And that's a legit deal, right? That yeah. Then we define intimacy differently, you know, and we try to, not that we're keeping score, but, you know, did we make our spouse feel like, did they know we love them through phys physical touch? You just give them a hug while she's cooking or whatever. You know, all those things on the personal side, the relationship side, but then the financials and the business moving forward. I think it was Morgan Stanley. They have the television commercial, follow your green line, right? Or whatever, whatever company. That, and that's kind of our same thing. So we're auditing the successes and failures. Kind of comes, um, not going to do a plug because I don't sell this. 
but I built this a few years ago and I took kind of the best of planners. And one of the things that I love, like when you get to the end of a day and you can kind of see what's here is you have goal ratings and you keep track of everything on a daily basis. So we kind of take this and use this every week to where we can go in and audit and see what our successes and our failures are. Because I'm fine failing once. I just don't want to do it two times in a row, right? Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's really cool. There's a lot of different planners out there. I think finding a good one that fits for you is difficult. And But grading yourself is a key thing that I've noticed. And I have some friends that are in GoBundance. And I know they look at multiple different pillars of life, right? And how are we doing in our personal life and our sex life, mental health, business, et cetera where are we at? And they're grading themselves on that. And so I think that's a really cool thing to think about. Hard to be honest sometimes too with that. And I think tying your spouse into that and having those weekly meetings, weekly tag ups, how you're doing is really important and something that's difficult to do in busy life. We try in the slow household, we got a two and a half year old. And so we could be better about it, but just finding that time to spend quality time together, that's really important. I don't have time is the adult version of my dog ate my homework. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's what you prioritize. Yep. hundred percent. you prioritize. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Bill, I want to be respectful of your time. I could talk to you in forever. Uh, I think there's so many incredible topics, incredible things that we've hit on and haven't even hit on yet. Um, but I really want to value your time and appreciate your time. Is there any some uh, parting shots, any closing thoughts that you have, or maybe something that we haven't touched on? No, I think we, we touched on a lot. I think the big thing is really I don't know if you're familiar with my STR super team and, you know, we have uh, an accelerator and we had quite a few physicians that were in our accelerator program and that graduated into, we have a war room, which is like the super high end investing type of platform. And some of the things that we see is just specifically with professionals, you really need to invest into yourself or find guidance in how to underwrite these properties. So we have, and a lot of people are afraid of like our performance because we have like a, a baby daddy is what we call it. And then the big, and that big daddy has like 15 tabs on an Excel spreadsheet, but I believe it mitigates our risk like to less than two and a half percent. And one of the problems is a lot of us tell ourselves stories. You got to be honest. Well, we got to be honest with ourselves first. And if we have to start telling stories about the investment and we can't just hand somebody the performa to make a financially driven decision, then it's probably not a very good investment. So that's part of that financial literacy component that I think is is super important. And it's something that we really focus on. And, and I hope that everybody does just to always become a better investor, always become stronger at underwriting because our deals make or break in the underwriting process. Yeah, absolutely. Underwriting is key and kind of keeping the emotion out of it is so important, which having the data to back that up, especially as physicians are very analytical people. We want the numbers, we want the facts. Having that data, I know would certainly make myself and would make other physicians feel a lot more secure in that investment decision. So that's really important point. Where can folks reach out to you, Bill, if they want to know more, if they want to get involved in your mastermind, hear more about the war room, where are some ways folks can reach out to you? You can just hit me up, BillFaith73 on Instagram, F-A-E-T-H, BillFaith73, Build str wealth you can find build short term rental wealth everywhere on youtube instagram tiktok facebook i've got thirty thousand members in my facebook group i'm very accessible i kind of pride myself on you know being accessible to you know anybody that needs help you know the war room and the accelerator that's part of my super team with jeff hampton avery carl ryan bakey kenny bedwell chris wharton that's just it's an incredible john the bank whisperer hodge is a huge component of that we are going to actually launch our accelerator in September. But one of the things that I think for your physicians would be to go to uh, superteam.com, that's SCR superteam.com, and check out our war room because we become your board of directors. And can you imagine having the best attorney, the best data analyst, the best super property builder, the best you know banking guy, the best CPA on your team? That's why, I mean, all these guys came out of my mastermind. That's why I, we started the super team. So that way we can help people make sure they don't make mistakes and make sure they maximize like literally 10x the results that they're looking for. That's incredible. Yeah. You got to spend money. You got to spend money to make money and it's worth it to get the right team and the right folks in your corner to help you with those decisions. 
make the right deals and turn those deals into home runs, which you guys do. I mean, that is just a stacked lineup of SDR experts. So really cool, Bill. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. This has been super valuable. When you're out, out west skiing sometime, let me know. Absolutely. I will do that. Thanks for having me, Alex. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Bill. Well, with that, it's Bill Faith and Dr. Alex Schlow with another episode of the Physicians and Properties Podcast. Signing off. Hey, real quick. If you're still listening to this, I'm assuming you got value from it. So I need your help specifically. My two-year vision with this podcast is to help 100,000 physicians Learn how investing in real estate can give you the freedom to practice medicine and live life how you want. There are two main ways that a podcast grows. One is the ratings and reviews, and the other is word of mouth. If you can please leave me a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, as well as send this to one to two friends that you think would get value from it, we can reach the physicians that we want to reach. Thanks in advance and talk to you on the next episode. Please note that the information shared on this podcast is for informational purposes only. It should not be considered financial or medical advice. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the host and the guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Department of Defense or the United States Air Force.